That's what this is all about, is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the God's children. This is a special edition of Speaking Freely, taped at the U.S. Comedy Arts Festival. And today we feature the work of two of the next wave of comics in America, Louis C.K. and Steve Marmel. Welcome. Thanks for having Thank us. You. We actually negotiated that next wave yeah. thing. You know, yeah, we, I, I, I went up, came out in the hallway, and I said, mm -hmm. so what do I call you guys? Next wave. Rising or... stars. Well, or... in retrospect, the idea of being a next wave after doing this for 20 years is a little yes. creepy and disheartening. Uh, it's nice, though. It's like being carded. <laughs> You buy liquor. But you know, that's sort of the reality. Years or something. Yeah. You do have to like have 20 years of dues before you, you kind do. of emerge. And why is that? Before you become a, a, a new young comic. Right. You have to do it for like 20 years. That's right. And how old were you when you began? Well, I was 18 when I started. I was and, in high school. And what did they call it? I mean, what's the embryonic description of you weren't the rising young star then? No, what did they I call you when a, you no, I was just a, a nuisance. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> a guy talking in front of an audience. Yeah, I think right. it starts right. with that. Yeah. And, and Steve, you actually began with a career in journalism in Yeah, moment. well, USA Today. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was a uh, freelance columnist for USA Today for a few years. The, uh, you know, they, they, in, the, in the editorial page, they'd have those, uh, those mandatory left and right opinions, and then the one thing that showed up under the cartoon, that'd be me. Oh, great. And that, that probably paid as well as most of your dates. Yeah, so I, uh, I kind of stayed in college and kept getting my grants while I was doing it, just so that I could, you know, stay in college. <laughs> Well, like a lot of other people who are stand-ups today, um, you do a lot of other work, and in your case, Lou, you've won an Emmy for your work as a as a writer. Right. And uh, do you approach that differently you know, when you when you uh, write for other people than stand-up? Yeah. For example, when you wrote for Conan, mm -hmm. is is that a different kind of voice you write than the one when you get up yourself? Well, it's just a. I think it's the same comic uh, voice or comedic point of view, really. But it, it, I just have more more. Uh, uh, talking heads to play with and stuff. When you write sketches, you just get to split yourself into different people and have props on the set and use editing and stuff. But it's to me, it's still the same sort of objective. But there's also a lot of freedom in just being on stage and being able to just yak out whatever you want. I have to ask, uh, you know, comedy's always been sort of pushing the envelope in terms of free expression, and, and yet today we live with a war on terrorism, and it's a period when in which um, well, we've had at least one press secretary warn us that we should watch what we say and what we should mm -hmm. joke about. Yeah. Has that had any effect on the work the two of you do? If, if anything, it's made me kind of more aggravated and, and more focused on talking about that stuff, because it's that whole you-can't-tell-me-what-to-do reflex. I mean, the, the minute that happened, you wanted to start writing jokes specifically on it, mm -hmm. uh, especially if that's what your passion's for. Yeah, for me, I, I, don't, I don't do a lot of stuff that's topical. Like, uh, what I do is a, a, a lot sillier than that. So, I mean, I, a lot of times I, I offend people, but it's kind of inadvertent. It's not because <laughs> I'm kind of going after the jugular and I hit a chord. It's just that I do something silly that somebody finds really... And, a, and a, a last nauseous. night you had some woman, like, just going, you can't say that! Yeah, just screaming some, at me. Somebody's second wife in Aspen was just going, you can't talk like yeah. that! You're not, li you're, yeah. you're, you're not right! But I wasn't saying anything provocative. I was just being a jerk. So, <laughs> me... It didn't really make. I mean, I, I did the Conan show not. Uh, I guess in November after September 11th, and I, I uh, had one joke I wanted to do about it that was rather, you know. And they tried to help me. They they try to help you get whatever you want on the air, but the standards people just didn't want uh. it on. And it, it was really more about that they knew if I said that on the air, that it would upset millions of people that would then write them and call and stuff like. We that. want to come back and talk about standards and practices sure. and, and writing for network and others. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you point out that you're not terribly topical in your work. On the other hand, you do yeah. a lot of topical material. Why does that hold some appeal for you? Well, uh, first of all, I think it's the journalism background and it's, it's just kind of being into the news and always being into the news and that's where my mind always is. And, and just kind of like not liking the fact that, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> I, the information I get, it doesn't feel like the right information, so I'm always kind of reacting to it like that. Comedy just allows you to kind of scream back at the TV with an audience mm -hmm. and yell at the newspaper with an audience, and you get that instant reaction. But it's, it's just these are the things that affect everybody, and these are the things that uh, you, you really want to talk about because you've got 45 minutes on stage to talk about whatever you want to talk about. 
I just like talking about stuff that really kind of affects everybody on a day-to-day -day life. I might not have their opinion on it, and I might annoy them, and it might really tick them off, but it's that same common mindset that, that's, that I get to kind of go into. Doesn't it really reduce the, the shelf life of your joke? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I you do. You gotta keep up with it. Yeah. But I, I found both things to work for people. Like, in, I, I live in New York and work the clubs there, so, I mean, pretty much right away after this thing happened, people, yeah. comics were talking about it very openly and freely, and people were at the clubs to listen. And I found that people were, they found that very cathartic to listen to a comic set. But at the same time, for myself, I found that when I went on stage and I would just get lost in this silly stuff, whenever we went on stage during that time, people were very tense. Uh, but then if you got them lost in your material and I would do all this crazy, silly stuff, then you'd see them just kind of forget everything. And there would be one point where they're laughing so hard at whatever stupid thing mm. I'm saying that they would, it, it was the first time any of us had felt like it wasn't a constant replay of this memory over and over again. So I became obsessed with going on stage as much as I could to do that for people as much as I could. And I went to all over the country and did clubs so that I could give people this little, you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes of that. It had to be different in New York, too, than it was in Los Angeles to, to be talking about this, because you walk out the door and it's right there. Yeah, and people were exhausted, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, it was a hard, hard time. But, but I saw both uh, approaches work for people. Some uh, other times, comics would be on stage just railing about it, and people were really engaged by that and found that to be a release also. You know, you both had tremendous success in a universe in which a very small percentage of comics actually make it. Uh, I suppose it's like aspiring baseball players. It's just a, a very small universe. Um, and and I have to believe that somewhere along the line, somebody warned you against pursuing this as a career, or were, were you led us, yeah. were you led astray at career day? Is it's that what happened? It's a very stupid thing to do for a living. <laughs> I think. I think it's yeah. it's an irresponsible choice to make. Uh, I think anything in show business is, but particularly comedy. I think that as soon as you decide to become a comic, you know, God bless you make the world laugh, whatever, but you lose the sympathy of the world. You have no right to gripe about anything that happens to you because it's just a dumb, I mean, what kind of a jerk <laughs> says, I'm gonna, there's no evidence that you're gonna, I mean, it's a million in one shot. It's, it's, the, it's, the stop, it's stopping and going, I'm funnier than everybody else yeah. in, in America. Yeah, and everyone's gonna notice just when they should and I'm gonna get all the breaks I, sh I should get. And it's ridiculous, it's stupid, it really is. Like, I have contempt for myself for doing it. <laughs> I have to believe that with that confidence you have to have, and you, you pointed out, then do you sometimes write jokes and the audience doesn't respond and you just go, they're wrong, I'm going to keep doing this joke? I mean, or is it always sort of testing and rewriting? Um, I kind of do what I think is funny and hope they laugh, um, but that's, that's a luxury you have when you've been doing it for a while. It's, yeah. if, when you're first starting and you're just getting your foot in the clubs, you don't really have the ability to go, you don't know what you're not laughing at, I, I'm brilliant, because <laughs> the club owner goes, no you're not, and you don't come back. Right. Um, but but eventually you get to a point where it's like you know you're right and you'll get the joke to work at some point. Yeah, I mean there's always you, it, the part of the job is to figure out when a joke isn't working, whether it's the condition in the room, maybe, well this was a particularly blah 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 crowd, so they weren't going to like that anyway, mm -hmm. and to not change it, but or to know that this is a defective piece of material and I have to right. make it work. Uh, okay. But I don't think the joke is I don't th I don't believe in doing something and it doesn't get a laugh and then saying. Well, I, if, to me, it went perfectly. <laughs> I mean, I could, you know, you have to reach people, or else, what do you, to me, anyway, to me, the challenge is, even if I'm doing something that's very far-fetched and very unlikely to relate to people, if I can get them to relate to it, that's a, that's a big... And as long as you're in a victory. comedy club and people are there to see comedy... Yeah, they paid money, you were hired on the premise that you were going to make people laugh, so I don't think you really have the right to uh, yeah. just do whatever you want. It, it recklessly regardless of that. Surprise, I'm doing drama this week. <laughs> well, as you know, this show is about free speech, and I, I gather you're actually most free on stage as a stand-up, and then there are increments, mm -hmm, depending yeah. upon whether you're doing network, TNN. Uh, what are the rules? What, what can you say on stage that you then cannot say on the Chris Rock show, which you wrote for, mm -hmm. which you then cannot say on the Dana Carvey show, which you wrote for? I mean, the, the networks, I gather, are the most kind of restrictive. Yeah, I would say that. Well, uh, on stage, you know, that e there's even degrees of that, because there are clubs that don't want you to say certain stuff. But to me... Talk about that. I'm curious. Well, I've never looked at that as like a censorship, because to me it's like you have 
you, you know, for, for the free speech is always there because you can stand on a street corner and say whatever you want or build your own club or find a way to reach people. But if you want to use someone else's facility that they've set up and that they are expressing themselves too by who they employ and who they present to their public. So if you want to work in a club, if their thing is we don't want guys that you do certain material. What kind of material would get them? Well, uneasy? some people just don't like blue stuff, right. stuff that's dirty sexually oriented cursing that kind of thing and there's certain clubs that just that's the profile that they build for themselves is we have family comedy so i but what i've grown to learn to do is that if if that's the kind of club it is i don't go there right and if if, if that's the kind of club it is i don't i'm not going to mince go there and negotiate bit by bit i'm just going to say thank you but i don't I, I don't want the work yeah there's 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 a club like in utah that you know it it's 80 percent mormon there so they have those constraints and you know that going into it Vegas audiences are there because they're not gambling for 45 minutes but it is the most middle of middle America so you can't go on there and you, you really can't hit a casino stage and take casino money and expect to be able to sit on a soapbox and and not have that in the back of your head at some point yeah. if you're known for that if you're if you are a Chris Rock yeah. or you are a Dennis Miller and you are booked in Vegas or you're an Andrew Dice Clay even and you're and you're in that room people know exactly what they're going to get when they walk in that room yeah. but I think if you're a comedy club and you walk in and you're not the draw the comedy is the draw then they expect to see comedy and you kinda have to play by those yeah, rules. Yeah here's actually that's what I was thinking is that you know you have to if you're good enough you can say anything you want that's and I think that that goes into television too is that if you want to say something outrageous or provocative you have to do it with quality and in a way that people that people connect with because then because uh, since I've gotten better at comedy now I work clubs that I didn't use to because they didn't want me because I was too dirty like clubs have called back and said come on over and I've said well you didn't want me because I was too dirty and they <laughs> said we don't care we want you <laughs> so I've worked those clubs since then on the basis that I can say anything I want because I'm saying it in a way that's that's popular do you know what I mean yeah. I'm, 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 I know what I'm doing now I'm not just some guy telling dirty stories crassly I'm telling really well-crafted, dirty stories. So, <laughs> so they want to be there, and I think that that's what you find in all facets of it. Is that if you can deliver, if you're good, you know. I mean, the guys that have been the biggest, Richard Pryor and uh, Eddie Murphy, and these and, and Sam Kinison, these were explosions right. in on in our culture that were unbelievably, uh, to most people, very offensive, very much in the you know point zero zero one percentile of thought in America but everybody wanted to hear it because they were so damn good at saying it and they got access to the airwaves to movies to all the stages in America yeah they got their voice out yeah because they're they're that, they're that good and I think that that's what's that's the onus on us in order to get the free speech that we want is to be good and at the other end of the spectrum I'm curious so I mean if somebody's 18 years old and says I'm going into comedy but you know what I'm never gonna use a curse word and never gonna use dirty material mm -hmm. Do they have a chance? Oh, sure. That's yeah. there's a lot of people that really like that. There's, you know. Yeah, but I mean, can you name some prominent comics that sort of Jerry Seinfeld never curses on yeah. stage. Jeff Foxworthy. Jeff Foxworthy. I'm Robin Williams. Uh, you know, he was dirty in some stuff, but that's not what made him big. There's actually Stephen a, Wright. There's I a mean, big wave of, uh, and I don't, not to use the word again, but there's <laughs> there actually is a uh, a community of clean comics, and they build themselves as clean comics, okay. and they work those rooms, and they work family audiences, and. They'll do afternoon shows, and they it, clubs kind of have a rating system now. There's a club in yeah. uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, mm -hmm. actually that actually rates the show, so you know what's coming in, and you know what you're getting, and you can choose by the tone of comics. And there is a market for that. Yeah, because the thing that's hard is that people. I mean, we should be able to say whatever we want, blah blah blah. The clubs should be able to have the show they want. But what happens, no matter how hard you try to be careful, people collide with offensive right. ideas. People go, they just look at an ad in the paper, there's a comedy club I'm going to go, and then they hear something that really upsets them. It happens. And what's interesting is it's, it's not necessarily a word as much as it's an idea. And you can't, you can't really put a rating on an idea. So if, if you're doing a material on religion and you don't curse, but you're doing material on religion, that could be enough to make somebody snap and go, this isn't the show you promised me. Yeah, I mean, like, Lenny Bruce uh, was the foul-mouthed comedian, but if you listen to his albums, I have all of them, and none, he doesn't curse, ever. He doesn't use the F word or anything. It's just that he talks about stuff so deeply, and he gets, you know, especially for back then. And he's a lot of racial epithets, which were, right. were provocative right. audiences right. at the time. Yeah. I I'm curious, if you played that club that has the rating, what rating are you comfortable with? Um, I don't... I would probably get an R. Um... 
it's I, I I don't have to swear, but I don't like to have to put a muzzle on me so it comes out. Um, topic wise, it's it's politics and religion and could be deemed uh, offensive to some. So I'd probably get either a PG thirteen or an R. When you when people are offended by you, uh, which is not always a bad thing, as you point out. Um, what are the hot buttons? Race, religion, sex? Uh, it, if, yeah, there's some things you just can't talk about. I mean, that, it, it, and what I mean when I say you can't talk about it, it's just that you're not going to get away with it without repercussions, you know, without sweating for the next, for the rest of your set and, <laughs> and just feeling uncomfortable uh, in a room full of people that hate you. That's really the, the bargain you're making. If you want to make keep them friendly and feel good while you're on stage, you don't. You know what I mean? Or you find ways to say that stuff that's not going to... Anyway, but I don't know what are the big things. You can't... Like abortion, if you just yeah. say that word, people just... Uh, even people that are pro-choice don't want to hear about abortion and cancer. Yes. Cancer makes people just click off. Yeah. And, uh, and white guys can't say, you know, nigger, <laughs> you know. And uh, although I just did. You did. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I salute you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, and and that, see, that's, it also depends on what you know, kind of a person you are and, and how you carry it off, too. There are guys that can say anything and get away with it, just because they're, they're confident enough. When you wrote for the Chris Rock show, you had a lot of latitude. It, it, oh, yeah, insane latitude. <laughs> and, it's and, outrageous. <laughs> and was there ever a time, even on that show, you were told, no, no. we can't do that joke? No, there wasn't. That was, I mean, because I had started at Conan, and that was, you know, we were trying to do edgy kind of comedy and a lot of times we get called to the carpet for with standards and have to try to negotiate stuff and then Dana Carvey was on primetime on ABC right. on the Disney network and that was really hard uh, and then Chris Rock was I mean it, we barely checked with people before broadcast you know? <laughs> I mean it's unbelievable the kind of stuff and even the, the big the big barrier that HBO took away um, is religion that in, in TV religion is the one thing you cannot yeah. mess with you can get away with certain graphic stuff and certain sexual innuendos and scatological humor you can you know Conan has all the, the you know the robot on the toilet and the, <laughs> the masturbating bear you know and all this kind of stuff and he gets away with that but you can't say Jesus Christ you yeah. can't say that it's that's an absolute hard ceiling and there's no there's no negotiating it. and you can't say god damn it yep uh, you can't talk about jesus even in a sort of you know if you're in a playful way that's they just say no you may not do that uh and on hbo you know it just <laughs> didn't matter and i i did shockingly nasty stuff was there anything there. on rock that didn't uh, that didn't go through it, it just had to be funny i mean there was nothing yeah. that it, it that was the only thing that it wouldn't you know no, but nothing. I mean, and we, and we really, you know, it was, and in a way, it was kind of a. It, it, it's fun to play the game at the networks. And it's fun to try to see what you can sculpt out of their, the material that they allow you to do. And it's like being a lawyer because the standards people. It's not you're not talking to the FCC or the federal government. You're just talking to a guy whose job right. is to sort of be the ears of the network and know what is going to cause trouble. And Whenever there's a bit that standards calls you to the carpet for, you get to make a case, and you get to talk about why you get to make freedom of speech uh, um, claims to it too. Can you remember one where you where you had to go and explain? Yeah, and this is a good example because actually it was about religion. Um, Rudolph Giuliani was upset because a Brooklyn museum had a oh, right. Madonna with feces on it, and so he said. Uh, hey, everybody can make fun of Catholics. It's not fair. You know, all these other groups get this kind of protection. Meanwhile, nobody cares if you make fun of Catholics. And my joke was, well, yeah, th that's true. You can make fun of Catholics, but that's because they're wrong about God. They, they're <laughs> the wrong religion, so we should be allowed to make fun of them. And so I wanted to do that, and of course they said, you can't do it. Uh, but I, I got to talk on the phone of the standards guy. And my, the, from working at Conan, I learned that, um, and this was a sta a doing stand-up on Conan, I learned that you have to make a case for why you should be allowed to say it. Um, and my case was that Giuliani was on every network saying what he felt and that people shouldn't smart. be shut out of saying the opposite view. So that got me kind of shoehorned into their, okay, so how can you say this that won't uh, 
get us all the phone calls. It's not really about the law, it's just they don't want the hassle. So the guy actually, the standards guy, came up with a way to tell the joke that was palatable. I had to just sound like I was sympathetic. Instead of saying, yeah, we make fun of Catholics because they're wrong about God, he said, just say, it's true, people make fun of Catholics a lot, but that's because they're wrong about God. Just that intonation, I got the joke on the air because I just changed the tone of voice a little bit. And, that, and that's, I think, the most important part because when you're in a club or you're doing stand-up for 300 people, there's all, these, there's all these people that get to have their opinion everywhere on mass media. And it's like having the best Bush joke and having the best Clinton joke and doing it in a club in Omaha and having just that small group of people hear it and make the connection you're making is great for that moment, but it doesn't really move the ball down the field about getting your opinion out there if that's what matters to you. Right. Yeah. No, and, and I mean, it, I've found that there are ways to get stuff in like that. I mean, I, I'm surprised, but that did, I did get to do that joke on network TV because they, you know, they found a way to... But, and, and it's not always just about language or stuff. Like, like when I was at Dana Carvey, we did something about Pat Buchanan eating a, the heart of an immigrant. We showed him pulling it, <laughs> just eating it. And uh, the this standards... was live footage of him actually eating it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the standards guy, his issue wasn't, OK, that's too graphic or dirty. He's like, well, you, we don't, you don't have a right to accuse Pat Buchanan of eating the heart of an immigrant. That's not fair to him as a human being. I'm like, are you afraid he's going to sue us? He's no, I don't. I don't feel like we should be allowed to say that about this person. So it's, it's you never know what's going to push the button. You were also the screenwriter uh, on a film called Down to Earth, which, which starred Chris Rock. Mm -hmm. a heartwarming movie. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and not at all coarse or rude or... No. And uh, did you have to sort of reset the thermostat to write that? Not really. I don't want to give the impression that that's the, I'm just like a dirty comic. It's just that I kind of stray into, and actually a lot of the stuff that I do, probably 60% of it is totally clean. It's just that I stray into really dangerous areas. Uh, but that was uh, fun because we were just writing a Hollywood movie. That mm -hmm. was, that's what that was about, was trying to just accomplish that. Was know? that harder than you thought it would be? No, it was really easy for me. I had kind of low... Uh, <laughs> responsibilities. <laughs> I, I was asked to write, uh, rewrite some of the characters and sort of rebuild some of the characters, make them sillier. So I, I, that it was just fun. I mean, it was just fun to take something that I mean, it was already written like thir thirty times. Warren Beatty wrote it. Everybody had written it. So we just kind of plugged our own people into it. But it, it was, you know, it was it, that's the you kind of make a bargain with whoever you're working with, you know, or working for. They they've got the studio or the network and they're just sort of set up. And if you want to use their podium you gotta you know you gotta talk to them you have to do what they you know and the studio is not a place that wants you to just say whatever you want i can't just in the middle of down to earth just write some rant about what i <laughs> think about something and if i don't like it i don't have to i don't have to work at that studio and if i don't like the way the clubs treat me i don't have to be a comedian i can get like a real skill and contribute to society <laughs> so I, I i just have never believed in griping about no one's letting me say what I want. You know, if you're not if you're not good enough to present your stuff in a way that people want to hear it, then you know. We've only got a few minutes left, and I wanted Sorry. to I wanted to ask each of you um, about a. Uh, you know, we've we've established that both of you talk dirty on stage, uh, and well, I do. He, you don't. I I like the right too. I, I don't see. always. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But but you both do kind of. There's some heartwarming art in your resume as well, uh, and, and including uh, uh, the work you've done, uh, Pop Across America, uh, where you out, go out across the country, and, and also some work for Nickelodeon. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about writing for a broader audience and maybe even a younger audience? It's just a nice thing to be... It, it, it's, I know it sounds really sappy, but occasionally it's really nice to just be able to tell something warm and, and, uh, and funny that everybody can enjoy. And then know that I can, by the way, go out the following evening and just rail on the stuff that angers me. But, but there's this little piece of my life that um, uh, I, I think gives, gives something back to families and kids, too. Well, I'm sure people will see a lot more of your work. And we've already talked about you being emerging stars. Do you have any predictions about the future of comedy? Does the Internet play a role in any of that? Well, yeah, and I think that the, the Internet is, I mean, it, you know, p people have already said it's, it's got inherent differences between TV and stuff is that it's proactive. It's not passive. You can't have it on and walk around the house. Uh, you can't drift. You have to really be staring into it. And I think that's just a barrier that will never go away. People will never use the Internet the way they 
they get into TV and right. stuff. But it, to me, if you think of it, it, it's like I have a website. And uh, my website, I realized I can't really make it as an entertainment thing that people come to and feel like they just saw a great movie or something. But it's just a catch-all. These are just place. They're addresses. Right. They're places to go to if you're, you know, if people see one of my movies or see me on TV, they could find my website and and see some and find out about other things I've done. That's really the best it's going to get. And I try to make them laugh on the website occasionally and put some d dumb jokes or little little cartoons and stuff. But. I, I actually like I like using it with the the idea of you can record your shows, you can digitize your shows, and you can put your stuff up. So you've got the ability to mass distribute with no filter. Yeah, it's the access that's there, but but it really is it does give you the ability to be ex as free as you want to be because you're your own studio network, whatever. So yeah, you can do whatever you want. It is it's kind of cool, but it's also exhausting because it just takes forever <laughs> to build these pages and to make the little things and put them up. It's just so so you know time-consuming. We've covered a lot of territory and uh, it's been a great conversation. I do hope though that when you guys are like the old wave and charging a lot more money that you'll mm -hmm. come back and join us again. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You just can't call us old. <laughs> That's right, the senior wave. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Join us next time as we continue our discussion on free expression and the arts. For more information about Speaking Freely, visit our website at www.speakingfreely.org.